My name is Nancy Higgins. I'm currently the Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer for Bechtel, which is a global engineering and construction company. This is the fourth major company that I have done this job for, <laughs> and I've been doing it probably since 1994 or so. I think that's right. Would you mind telling us the other company? Yeah, um, well, I was in private practice in the law in New York and Seattle for about 10 years when I went to the Boeing company to manage their litigation. And after a while, I came to the realization that litigation was a horrible waste of societal assets, and it would be a heck of a lot more fun to keep people from getting into trouble in the first place than getting out of trouble once they were already there. And there happened to be uh, an opportunity in an organization that was not an organization, really, a part-time job in the legal department called Director of Ethics and Business Conduct. I think that's right. And the reason it was offered to me is my boss, the general counsel, wanted to get me into... Boeing executive management, and you had to have a director title in order to do that. So this job was really managing ethics and business policy and working with something called the uh, Ethics and Business Conduct Committee to hold meetings and decide on ethics and business conduct policies, which in those days were actually government contracting compliance. <laughs> and uh, we had at the company then ethics advisors for each operating organization, but they never really got together. Something I found out when I was told my first job would be to hold, uh, to plan a meeting of the ethics advisors that happen once a year. And um, so... When I brought, I thought, well, let's get them together to figure out what we should do at this meeting, what are the issues they're dealing with. And as I talked about, I wanted their help in planning what would be a, a, what, a valuable meeting for the group. I remember one of them saying, this is the first time we've ever been together in the same room except for this annual meeting that happens every couple of years. And, uh, you know, so I started thinking, well, that's not right, and working with them and um, you know, having uh, opportunities for us to talk about what would be good for the company. And gradually, I started spending more and more time doing this and less time doing litigation because it was much more interesting. And uh, when the company decided, um, I think it was, I think it was after the, uh, the first sentencing guidelines in what was that, 1991 or something, um, that, you know, we had to look at that and figure out how to how we would organize to comply with it, we decided that we would have a full-time um, ethics and business conduct program. And um, I was asked to lead that. And, and initially the idea was I would still be working in the legal department um, and, you know, doing this as part of, that job, and I remember the uh, going to with my boss, the general counsel, to sit with uh, the then CEO of Boeing, Phil Condit, and you know I was thinking this is my opportunity to get this executive title. It'll be just wonderful. I'll get into what they call the E series, and uh, the the. My boss was explaining how, you know, I'd still report to him, and but, you know, he could use me as much as he wanted, and I could also do work in the legal department. And I remember him leaning back in his chair and saying, well, we could do that, but I think people have a hard time understanding these dotted line things, and I think he should, Nancy should report to me. And you can borrow her back, you know, if she has time whenever you need her, but, and that's really how it started out, my reporting to, um, I guess then he was not the CEO, he was the president and COO, and Frank Schrantz was the CEO, Frank Schrantz for whom the um, 
but the company later endowed a chair in ethics at Seattle University in Seattle. And uh, yeah, that, that's how it got started. And after, you said you've been with four organizations. So we've got Boeing. Yeah. Is there so, a highlight of where you went, and then we might go back to some of the stuff? Sure. Um, I, after, I did this at Boeing and at Lockheed Martin, or I ran their program, and then left Lockheed Martin to join MCI after the WorldCom debacle when they were in bankruptcy and suspended um, from doing business with the federal government. Had a time that was about, what, three months before their largest customer, the U.S. government contract, was going to be up for bid, and if they weren't off the suspension and debarment list by then, they would not be able to renew that contract. And then um, I was there for a few years when we sold the company to Verizon, and I took a year off and uh, walked the Camino de Santiago in Spain, and then uh, decided that I missed working for a company and went back to work at Bechtel in San Francisco. Well, when I was trying to get companies and uh, senior executives to follow my ideas, at the beginning it was quite easy because there was no such thing as an ethics and compliance program. And uh, the uh, particularly working for Phil Condit, um, who was one of the most ethical people I've ever met, um, he, you know, was more than willing to let me, you know, take a run at it and. You know, I remember his advice was, you know, I want you to always be nervous that you're exceeding your authority. And when you get to the point that you're really nervous, then get some time on my calendar. Don't just grab me in the hallway, you know, and, um, you know, book an hour and we'll talk about it and make sure we're both still on, on the same path. And, uh, you know, he was just supportive of anything that I wanted to do. And I know that the, shortly after I became involved in the, what was in the Ethics Officers Association, we hosted the meeting in uh, Seattle. And Phil came to talk to the group. And I told him that one of the things that everyone was always going to be interested in hearing about was how you got the uh, company to take ethics officers seriously and, um, and, and pay attention and um, how, you, how one would get the support of senior management. Something that I couldn't imagine was the case because I'd always had so much support there. But I remember him talking to the group and saying, I don't see how you can do your jobs if you don't have the support of senior management. And he said, you know, integrity is one of our values that includes, and he listed things like uh, quality and, um, all, you know, all the other raft of things. And he said, they're all important. You have to do all of them equally. You have to do them at the same time. It's not like ethics is more important than schedule. Part of ethics is meeting your commitments and your schedule. And safety, you've got to do it all. And, um, so really that was the case in... At, and certainly when I went to Lockheed Martin, that company that had been in trouble and already had a requirement to have an ethics and compliance program, you know, the defense companies that had been in trouble very, took it all very seriously. Um, when I went to MCI, they were still in trouble. And, you know, you didn't need to spend any part of your time talking about why ethics and compliance, why a program was important. Because they got that. They knew that they were hanging on by a thread, and if they had any more ethics failures, the company would not survive. And uh, at the time, I remember saying that I was not going to be satisfied until people heard MCI and thought model for corporate integrity. I don't know that I ever achieved that before we sold the company, but that uh, they, were, they took it very seriously. Bechtel was the first company that I worked at 
that really had no idea what an ethics and compliance program would look like. They were, they are a, a basically a family-owned company where ethics is so key to their um, to their self-view and the DNA, as they like to say, of the company. What they didn't understand was what a program was. We're ethical. Why would we need a program? I think when they brought me in, they really thought that an ethics and compliance program meant um, complying with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, because that's one of the biggest risks of an international um, global uh, co- company like Bechtel. But um, you know, they, uh, they've been tremendously supportive and just kind of accepted what we've done. And now I've been there almost 12 years and People can't imagine what it was like before they had an ethics and compliance program. It's so built into the way the company runs. Can you compare some of the features of an ethics and compliance program? What do you, what's your created at Bullard? What you now have at Are there any parallels, things that you've seen are consistently done, or new features, or things that we used to do that we stopped, we stopped doing over the course of the time? Yeah, well, at Boeing, we were inventing it as we went along. Nobody had, (laughs) there wasn't any such thing as an actual uh, established program. We had the Defense Industry Initiative with the um, six six principles, I think they were called, that basically became the foundation for the sentencing guidelines. that we what were they we started out that we needed to have policies and procedures we needed to have training um, in those policies and procedures we needed to have mm, periodic checks and things like that um, and to be sharing best practices and continually improving the program when I say we need to have you know, the, everything in the defense industry initiative was voluntary, was decided by the companies, and it started, came about as a result of the uh, Packard Commission looking into fraud, waste, and abuse in the defense industry. And the Packard Commission came out with these recommendations for what they called self-governance, that a company, you know, should have principles and govern itself if they didn't want the government to come in and govern it for them. And so um, a bunch of the uh, CEOs got together, a couple of general counsel and the CEOs were not available. And, you know, they wrote down these six principles on the back of a napkin. And that's what happened. And one of them was that they would have the um, a uh, steering committee made up of the CEOs of the member companies and they would have a working group where each company would uh, volunteer someone to be part of that and they would together um, figure out a way to implement these uh, six principles and companies would join by having the CEO certify sign on to the six principles they would then have their compliance with these audited by one of the, I think they were then big six <laughs> accounting companies, and um, and they would then certify to the DII um, coordinator that they were in compliance, and um, or not that they were committed to it, not uh, actually doing it all. One of them was voluntary disclosure, and that was the hardest things for. Com- hardest thing for companies to agree to because basically you were agreeing that if you came across something that constituted fraud um, or a violation of the government contracting rules, you would go to the government and say disclose it and work it out. <laughs> and I'm, am I allowed to reminisce now? <laughs> when um, when I was interviewing with the new general counsel to go to Boeing to uh, run litigation. I remember him, uh, Ted Collins, saying to me, you know, they've got this really strange thing that they've just agreed to. You know, they're going to they're have a, uh, a hotline 
And that that was another one of the principles. You had to have a method by which employees could report misconduct um, separate from line management um, without fear of retaliation. And so we're going to have this hotline, and people can call in and, and report this stuff. And and if they do, then they're going to tell the government. <laughs> and as lawyers, we were like, what? That's just appalling to think anybody would do this. Um, but that's, in fact, exactly what they did. But um, the uh, the self-disclosure requirement of, to be a member of the DII was one of the um, sticking points for a lot of companies. I remember Lytton, um, which later became part of uh, Lockheed Martin, um, wouldn't sign on because of that. But the... Uh, the voluntary disclosure requirement didn't say actually that you had to disclose everything. It said that if you had to have a policy that if you discovered something that would have been disclosable, then the general counsel, the company would consider disclosure. And most of the companies had policies that said the general counsel would determine whether it actually was something that violated the law and then if it did, they would consider disclosure, something like that. Um, but uh, we made a couple of voluntary disclosures while I was there. Lockheed Martin had a different view, but their view was they were going to disclose everything. And, um, you know, had really a terrific relationship with the um, DOD and the suspension and debarment fellow because, you know, they would go in every few minutes, it seemed, with a little thing that, you know, we want to tell you about this problem that's come up. We're going to check it out. You know, we'll keep you informed. And I thought that was really a brilliant strategy because, uh, you know, the suspension and debarment person was always on your side. I remember one time the, uh, the suspension and debarment fellow for the DOD um, when I was at Lockheed, you know, came over to visit and told me he was absolutely outraged that this other government entity um, was going to require the company to take certain steps um, with regard to, uh, I think it was a, I can't remember what the violation was, but he said, you know, he told them that was ridiculous. We had a fabulous program and that to require more training than we already required was just a waste of money and time. <laughs> I thought, yep, this uh, this is working. <laughs> so thinking about the work you've done, two, two-part question. One is, could you have done what you've accomplished without your legal background, your legal training? And at what point do these professions start to... Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly at the beginning, um, it was primarily lawyers doing this kind of work, um, you know, because they were first happening in the defense industry. Um, I remember when I was chair of the um, DII working group, um, having a, um, we had a 10th anniversary celebration, and I was speaking at that event um, and reminding the group, I think I told the, uh, the Ted Collins anecdote, and how almost everybody at the beginning was lawyers, but now as the groups had evolved from simply legal compliance to really more values-based, that there were a lot more people in the room who were not lawyers. And I thought that was good. Um, you know, there was... I continue to believe that um, for the most part, the best ethics officers are those who are lawyers because it's so important to know where that line is so you never get close to it. But there's a lot of activity that is really a business decision, and the management can decide to do um, – they can pretty much decide how they're going to run their company um, as long as they don't cross that line. And you don't ever want to get close to the line, but you want to know where that is, I think, one of the problems with um, ethics officers who are not legally trained is they tend to confuse the company policies with the law. 
rather than recognizing that they can be changed um, for for better or or for worse. Uh, one of the policies I remember at um, Boeing that came out of the defense industry was the you could not use frequent flyer miles that you earned in company travel for personal um, use. They belong to the company. And uh, the uh, so in those days, frequent flyer uh, rewards were paper-based. And I think uh, an airline that no longer exists, Northwest, used to send out these certificates when you... Um, when you had enough to have a free ticket. Well, because the Justice Department and the government took the position that these were owned by the government, which is why these defense companies did that, all of the frequent flyer benefits and the mail about it went to uh, the travel organization, and they would keep track. And when, <laughs> when you had a business trip that you wanted a ticket for, they would see if you had one in your little file, and they would monitor it. If it was going about to expire, they would give it to somebody else. Of course, you had to sign <laughs> on the uh, on the little certificate in order to make it valid. But you know, it was too much trouble to send it back to the actual employee and have them sign. So. Uh, they would just sign it and take it along, and they'd take it to the airline who knew what was happening, even though that was against their rules. But Boeing was a big customer as well as a, a client. So um, aside from that, that was one of the first things I took on to stop them doing that signing thing. But uh, But I was, as a lawyer, able to come up with a theory that when you agree to travel for Boeing, on business, you were impliedly consenting to having the company sign these for you. And so unless you took that back, which you certainly had a right to do, but not if you wanted to continue to travel on company business, then that that would be the difference. I I bring up this ridiculous example simply because um, I, I thought that it was a, a lot of the companies had stopped doing that. Boeing kept doing it because the current CEO thought that this was an ethical thing to do. And um, I tried to point out that it was not unethical. It was to use your frequent flyer miles for personal travel. It was unethical to violate the company policy against doing that. Yet all these people thought that that was you know, sort of like a basic um, ethical thing. And then when uh, some of the uh, other companies like car rental companies, credit card companies were awarding miles, then, you know, ethics officers thought, well, that was unethical for you to keep those miles. They had to go to the company account. And I, I pointed out we didn't have any policy against that. We specifically had a policy that said you could use your personal travel card and that the company card was to avoid cash advances. You don't know. So anyway, ultimately, we succeeded in getting rid of that, which made me quite popular in the company. But. How about things that have to be resolved in the last couple of decades, last two or three decades? Functions or features of ethics and compliance that feel like we've always done them. Your story at uh, when you are here at Mattel, but we really hadn't thought about it. 1995. Sure. Well, you know when when we started out, most of the training that people received was in areas of the law or compliance training that. Um, companies were afraid that you would violate. And the most likely ones in the defense industry had to do with with defense. Um, what we didn't have a lot of was training that allowed people to practice, um, you know, to practice recognizing and resolving ethics issues. Um, and the realization over time that the most important part of the program was the values and because you know we learned pretty quickly that you couldn't have a policy to address every conceivable thing that a company that an employee could do to cause trouble for the company Uh, but we um, we could 
teach them what was expected of uh, employees in terms of how the company wanted to be thought of, what you wanted to represent. And so they would ask questions. Uh, and, you know, we all knew that even if you had a policy, there was nothing you could do to stop someone who knew the rules to decide to break them. But you can't have them make sure they know you're not, they're not doing it for the company. That's not what the company is asking of them. But, and surround them with people who will recognize it. So I think um, over time we began to realize that there was a lot to be said for having people come to your ethics and compliance resources to ask for guidance in advance um, to help to understand what would be expected rather than only reporting um, instances of suspected misconduct. And that did come about gradually and I think is is still in place at most companies today. We... I think um, what happened that became um, what I think is not not a good way of looking at things is as a result of the Sarbanes-Oxley and the sort of re-legalification of ethics and compliance programs where when companies have really been focused on values, all of a sudden they had lawyers coming in to tell them how they should organize these programs, what they should do in order to make sure they complied with the securities laws, basically. And, you know, the lawyers on the whole knew nothing about this. And for some reason, um, the ethics and compliance officers and the experienced ethics and compliance professionals were left out of that discussion altogether. And so what I see is where the, you know, original um, sort of cadre of ethics officers looked at ethics and values and integrity as this umbrella and over various things, one of which was compliance with the law. And you complied with the law because it was one of your values that you would. Whereas post Sarbanes Oxley, you have lawyers running the programs who think it's a compliance program. And one of the things you comply with is your values and your code of conduct. And it's, it's surprisingly difficult to get some lawyers to understand that when it's so basic that, you know, it's, that it's, it's the values that are what are going to keep you out of trouble, not the rules. Yeah, I mean, certainly the big buzzword now in ethics and compliance is, you know, your risk assessment. Um, And in some cases, I think that that is a good way of looking at it. But, you know, probably your biggest risk is that people don't understand the, you know, how the values that they're expected to comply with. Um, I think that a lot of the effort now to, um, you know, sort of quantify all your risks and make sure that you're handling this in a way that you're prioritizing the highest risk areas, you know, it's, it's it, depending on the industry, um, it can be a waste of time, really. I mean, you know, you can go into a company and when you know what kind of work they do and where they're doing, you can, you know, count your risks and write write it down and then sort of start checking off to see whether, you know, the ones that you think are the highest are being appropriately addressed. Um, When I talk to the folks now who have these algorithms and are using uh, um, all these things to come up with these calculations, when, when they get off the panel discussion, what they will say is, yeah, it's pretty much what we came up with when we eyeballed it. But, you know, this, this makes everybody happy. And, you know, I've always worked for engineering-related companies, uh, depending on the kind of uh, company it is, a different kind of engineer, but they're all facts and data-driven. And so this does make people feel much more comfortable. 
I remember when I started at my uh, current company, Bechtel, and was making a list, you know, telling, you know, I, I first brought together a senior management committee because I knew that, you know, nobody was going to do anything because I said they should do it. We had to have, you know, executive sponsorship and an agreement about what would be done. And one of the things I said we needed to do was, you know, have a update the code of conduct. And one of the managers in the room, very senior guy, said, what's a code of conduct? Because they had their Bechtel business ethics booklet that had been created by the lawyers and was, I don't know how many pages of small print, you know, all this stuff. And no one had ever thought of it as being the code of conduct. And so the next question was, what's wrong with the old one? And I said, well, it should probably be updated once a decade, whether it needs it or not, and just take a look at it. And, you know, explaining how it had to be something that people believed in and would be able to uh, turn to and and find what the guidance that they wanted. And, you know, so we, um, I I told them that, you know, I was going to do it at a certain time. And they, uh, you know, they wanted to have a plan, a Gantt chart that showed all of this. And, you know, and they so what's your plan? And I go, well, you know, the plan is I talk to people and I write it and it's done. You know, nope, that didn't work. So we had to spend uh, a few months doing that. But what was really helpful about that and, and I learned from is that, you know, when you want to have something done by a certain time and you need to go through various levels of approval, you have to get on all of those schedules. And so something that I, in my mind, thought, yeah, I've got, I wanted to get it done in the first year. I've got, you know, maybe eight, nine months to do it. Piece of cake. But it actually had to be done in like two months or three months in order to get, uh, it on this agenda and get this endorsement and on to the next one. And, you know, we were able to do that by the end of the year, having the full board of directors approve it. And, um, you know, going through the various levels of review, comment, and endorsement, um, the final one before the going to the um, board level committees was the operating committee of the company. And they had approved it. And then we get to the audit committee on which group our CEO and president and COO sat. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going through this and getting comments from the CEO on footnotes in this thing. And, you know, that were really great comments based on his incredible knowledge of how the company worked and the people. And I thought... You know, I don't think I ever saw anyone give so much attention at a senior level to a policy or procedure than here. But, you know, he he also would talk about why it was so important that, you know, people, you know, follow the law and he'd give all the normal things. And he'd say, and if you get off, you know, if you find yourself out on a limb from an ethics or compliance point of view, then it's my job to saw that limb off <laughs> because, you know, we have an ethics and compliance program. We have all these resources. If you find yourself in trouble, go to those and, you know, we'll help you. But if, uh, you know, if you don't do that and you do something that um, is unethical and gets this company in trouble, then, you know, <laughs> I'm going to be... Uh, I'm not going to appreciate it because my name's on the door. And, you know, I understand his dad used to say, I'm going to walk you down to the jailhouse and slam that jail, jail door shut. And, you know, I spent a lot of time saying that I didn't really think, you know, that terms like zero tolerance were helpful, that people tend to think zero tolerance equals termination. And, Sometimes an employee doesn't think termination is the right punishment for the offense that they've seen. They want the conduct to stop. They understand that it shouldn't be happening. It's important, but they don't want to get somebody fired. You want people to feel comfortable coming forward and understanding that every instance is fact-specific. You know, you want to have consistent consequences for Um, violations of the code of conduct, but 
you know, there are always going to be differences. Do codes of conduct change behavior? You talked about the process you've gone through, the heavy investment. Are they the most productive use of ethics and I think they're essential. I think it depends on what the work product is. You know, I mean, some of the the new codes of conduct we see are really more um, exercises in graphic <laughs> um, imagination, and you know, they they don't. The important thing is that people can find guidance to help them decide what they should do in a certain circumstance to know when they should come forward and ask for help. And, um, you know, not, uh, it's, they're, they're not going to have all of the answers, and that's, it's important that people understand what it's for. Now, you've been in this business for a long time, which is wonderful. How, have, do you think these ethics and compliance programs make a difference? Have you seen it make a difference in some of these companies? I think it really does make a, a difference. Difference. Yeah, a pos- difference. Yeah, definitely a positive difference because, um, you know, it's something that everyone shares. Now, I will say that um, a code of conduct, if it's not really something that is believed in by the company, by, by the employees, and by the senior management, is just a waste of time. And people know that, you know, they... Yeah, what, uh, you know, they, they watch your feet, as one of the executives I worked with said. And, you know, they're going, you know, some, some places you'll go and you'll see that the code of conduct is a joke. <laughs> but, um, you know, if it's something that is, that people know is serious and they trust, um, trust that you're going to follow through on the things you say you're going to do and you show that, then I think it's very valuable. It can make a difference. And it has made a difference in our Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it has made a difference in the way um, employees act and the way management acts. And it's something you can hold on to rather like an ethical constitution. I'm not sure I can share many of these. (laughs) No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Um, one thing nice about having worked for four different companies is I can share a lot of anecdotes and no one knows which company I'm talking about. Um, you know, there are, you know, I think some people going into these positions may think that they're really more, you know, cheerleading and fluff and, uh, um, but, you know, you can really make a difference in the lives of employees. You, I remember one time, well, it was before I was running the program full time at, at uh, one of my companies. I guess that has to be Boeing. I remember standing on um, telling an employee that he was going to be a subject of a grand jury investigation. And, um, you know, the... Um, or he was going to be involved. I don't think he was the subject, but we we knew that the government was going to be investigating and he was going to be involved in it. And and I remember seeing him just look out the window and, you know, you're thinking, this is going to have an incredible impact on this man, his life, personally, his family, his career, and, um, you know, the absolute best result for him is that at the end of a couple of years of hell, nothing will happen. <laughs> and, and that made me realize that anything we can do to help people not go through things like that. He hadn't done anything wrong. He was, you know, what was, I, now that I recall, it was essentially an accounting disagreement between, you know, the government accountants and the Boeing accountants. And that was often the case. And what I learned from that is the importance of treating everyone with respect and that um, what had happened is some arrogant um, folks who believed that they were the pros, they were in this company, they had this position, and everybody working on the government side 
you know, these were all these government hacks who couldn't get good jobs. And as a result, they had a terrible relationship. Um, and, you know, the government had a way, you know, what is a criminal violation? What is a civil violation? What's a contract dispute to be negotiated is a matter of discretion in most cases. And if you don't treat people with respect, they're not going to hang around and talk with you. <laughs> they're going to make a criminal referral, which blows everything out of proportion and wastes a lot of time and money. Um, often it's not a criminal violation ultimately. But uh, So that that was one of the things that I recall, seeing this guy, what he was going to go through, and recognizing that, um, you know, one has to treat people with respect and put in place mechanisms to uh, get people to speak up earlier. Um, let's see. I think uh, I also remember a time when, um, you know, the times that you have to go to a senior manager <clears throat> and tell him or her that there is... Um, you know, we have serious allegation against someone that has been a senior member of the team for a really long time, that's trusted, that's a friend, who's really gone down a path that is putting the company at risk, and they're just going to have to step aside while we, you know, carry on like this. It's, uh, it's, that's really a hard conversation, and I've had to have that a couple of times. But, uh, you know, when it gets to the point where you're saying that, you know, if this isn't handled correctly, your interests and those of the company are going to diverge and you're probably going to need to get your own lawyer. <laughs> that kind of brings things back on, on track. And so, so how do you see the future? What do you think is going to be, uh, do you think that this, you know, these ethics, these I'm not real optimistic about how programs will work in the future. I think it's so much easier to decide that things should be run by, um, you know, computer algorithms to um, have everything done by data. I'm concerned about the... Um, collection of data um, in these vast data lakes with, um, you know, the thought that, um, you know, while they're intended in most cases in ways to make the company more efficient and improve um, business, the way business is run, I think they have the um, capacity to you know, make people feel like they're working for Big Brother. And that's going to make people not trust you. You know, so without transparency of how your processes work um, and having employees recognize, you know, what you're doing, why you're doing it, um, is for the benefit of the company, um, then people aren't going to come forward and talk to you about things that we need to know about. Um, so, just as I was saying earlier, that some things are a business decision and not an ethics decision, then, um, you know, businesses can make the decision that they're going to operate in one way or another and, you know, monitor this and that. Um, but I think you have to be transparent about it and, and that, otherwise you're going to lose what you need, which is people coming forward when they see something that doesn't strike them as right. So, last question. Advice or lessons learned you'd like to share with the upcoming crop of individuals who work in the field of ethics and compliance? I think, um, you know, one of the things that interests me about um, the way we go forward is the um, ubiquity of certifications that, and programs to have people come, you know, graduate with the capability of going off and being an ethics officer and running this on 
a program someplace. And, um, you know, it, for me personally, the value of that is gaining the shared vocabulary because it brings people kind of ahead. You don't need to sort of teach them everything <laughs> that you know. But I don't, I don't know that I think, see any value of them beyond that. Um, it kind of reminds me of the way I felt at the very beginning of my ethics and compliance career where uh, when I was invited to go on the board of the Ethics Officers Association and I said, well, first you have to know that I don't think of this as a profession. <laughs> I think of this as, you know, I, I think what makes me valuable in this role to the company is my knowledge of the company, my ability to talk to people, I knowing who to ask. Um, and, um, you know, but after a while, after I did it a while and had an opportunity to try things, see what worked, what didn't work, I began to realize that, you know, you actually do bring a lot to a new program because you're not going to waste a lot of time on the things that we found out, you know, did not work. Um, and so I think that, um, folks should remember that Basically, what we're doing is providing people with with two things. One, a way to come forward and raise issues that they're not comfortable raising with their manager for whatever reason. And you hope they will go to their manager, but if they won't, they have to have a place to go. And that they're, they'll get an answer, their concerns will be addressed uh, separate from line management, and they'll be to the greatest extent possible, protected from retaliation. And then on the other hand, you have the compliance side, which is making sure that everyone understands the rules, the company policies, the laws that apply to their job in an appropriate level of detail for the job they're doing. They don't need to know everything, but there are certain things they need to know to keep them out of trouble. Um, and then you have to be able to, um, you know, have the people skills to help people feel comfortable when, when they do come forward and get that done. So a long time ago, I was thinking about this. I thought, well, what, what does the ethics program do? And it, it's kind of like when you're raising children and, you know, you can get all the values in them that when they're growing up and you hope that when they get to an age of um, adolescence, when they'll never talk to the parent that, you know, it's in there, but you want them to have somebody to talk to. You, you know, talk to a teacher, a counselor, a clergyman or, or whomever, an aunt, <laughs> Um, but talk to somebody if you won't talk to me. And that's really what we have in our ethics programs, our, in our code of conduct guidance and the hotline where you can call and ask for advice. You know, we're sort of that trusted other person. We're, as a program, we're trying to peer proof our children, <laughs> peer proof the employees so they know what to do and they'll go ask for help if they see something that doesn't feel right. In your experience, consistency across all organizations, is the key motivator for them to have a compliance and ethics program? Is it a positive or negative? Is it fear of retribution and reputational damage on the one hand, or is it the right thing to do on the other? Which, is Which motivates the companies? I think it's a mix. Um, you know, I think back to uh, something that the fellow who was then the ethics and compliance person at GE told me, can't remember his name, Gene Menching, I believe? Yes. Yes, yes. And he was present at the last um, senior executive offsite that um, Jack Welch held. And uh, someone asked him, you know, what was his biggest worry? What kept him asleep at night? And according to Gene, what he said, it's the fear that someone somewhere in the company at whatever level is going to do something stupid and get this company in trouble and it's going to cost 
lots and lots of money for lawyers and accountants and management time that's distracting us from our mission and, you know, just a huge problem. And I remember telling um, the fellow who was then the president and later the CEO of Lockheed Martin about this and how, you know, what keeps managers awake at night was, you know, one of the talking points that I would use. And he said, yeah, I would agree with that, except I would say that think of what it's going to do to that employee. What if, you know, this person's life is going to be, you know, he's probably worked for I don't know how many years for the company and done everything he was asked to do and, you know, really tried to do the right thing. And now for the rest of his life, he's going to be remembered by this one mistake. And what did, what could we do to prevent that? How can we help people not go through that? And I thought, yeah, that's the right, that, that's sort of the difference between the business thing and the, and the people thing. And, um, you know, that's, that's the difference. You've got a mix of people. I often say I'm not after their hearts and minds. I'm after their behavior. But it's a heck of a lot more fun when you have their hearts and minds, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun.